Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you and we glorify you. You are three in one, eternal and infinite. You are love and you are life. And we thank you that we can know you. And we pray that you would build us up in our knowledge of you and in our love for you and in our walk with you. Father, we know that prayer is such a big part of our walk with you. And so we ask that you would help us this afternoon as we study more about prayer, that you would open our hearts and our minds to see what we pray, especially in this petition, the third, the, the third petition, as we think about your will and longing to live your will. Father, we pray that you would give us hearts that want to hear and learn and grow. And we pray that you would bless us through this prayer, that we may live it out in our lives and make it every day. We pray, Father, that you would be with us as we are gathered here together once again in worship. We thank you for the opportunity. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who are unable to be with us due to health reasons. Lord, we're able to come here in smaller numbers due to, to COVID restrictions and we're thankful for the opportunity that we have, but we all know that there's, there's many of us who are dealing with various health challenges where even this is not something that they can do, and they've been isolated, they've been separated from the body of Christ in person, and so we pray, Father, that you would surround them with your love and care, and that you would also move things in such a way that they might once again be able to worship together with us. We pray that an end would come to, to COVID and to the restrictions connected with it. We pray, Lord, for healing, and we pray for restoration. And Father, we pray that we would make the use, make the most of the time that you have given to us to be able to worship you publicly and freely. And we pray that you would bless this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So the text for the sermon this afternoon is the Word of God, as we have summarized it and confessed it as church in Lord's Day 49. And before we read that Lord's Day, we're going to read a few passages from Scripture. We're going to read a few verses from Jeremiah 31, and then we're going to jump to the New Testament, to Matthew 7, and then finally to Romans 12. So first then, let's read God's Word. we we'll read Jeremiah 31. Verses 31 to 34. This is God's word. <clears throat> Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those de days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So then we'll turn to Matthew, Matthew 7, and we'll read from verse 21 to 27. So Matthew 7, beginning at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And then finally we'll turn to Paul's letter to the Romans and we'll read a few sections from Romans 12 and Romans 13. So Romans 12, we'll read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll jump to Romans 13 and read verses 8 through 14. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then we'll jump to the next chapter, chapter 13, and we'll read verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is God's word. Now we'll turn our attention to the the catechism lesson for today. We've been working our way through the Heidelberg Catechism, and this section that we are in the middle of right now is on prayer. The Lord's Prayer is being explained, and we have now come to the third petition. So this is our confession, question 124. What is the third petition? Answer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, grant that we and all men may deny our own will and without any murmuring obey your will, for it alone is good. Grant also that everyone may carry out the duties of his office and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. This is our confession. Brothers and sisters in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this petition is a prayer and a plea for obedience to God's will. That's what the third petition is. It's different than the second petition. The second petition is your kingdom come. In that petition, we pray that God's, God's rule would be extended. We pray that, that His name would be honored and glorified. But here in the third petition, we long for His, His will to be done. We long to see obedience to God's will. And it's a plea that all believers make. You know, when you look at your life, when I look at my life, when I look at my heart, I see that God's will is not always obeyed. It's not always done promptly and sincerely. I often will go my own way. We often will go our own way. We struggle to obey. We struggle to rest in God's will. And it pains us. Every single believer goes through this. We struggle with sin. If you're here this afternoon and you say you don't struggle with sin, 
you are like the person in James 1, verse 22 to 25, the man who looks into the mirror of God's law and then says, I look pretty good. I don't see anything wrong. So this is a prayer that every Christian makes, a plea for obedience to God's will. Now, as we talk about this, this commandment, there is a distinction that we need to recognize, and every time we hear a, a sermon on this Lord's Day, you will likely hear this distinction explained. There are two ways of talking about God's will. And I know in the past I've explained this, but I'll, I'm going to, like I said, every time we get a sermon on this Lord's Day, you just have to understand it. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Moses is speaking to the people of Israel and he says, the secret things belong to God, but the revealed things have been given to you. So there's two types of will, God's will. There's a secret will and there's a revealed will. The secret things, the divine decree of God that that governs all things that are going to happen in our lives, that is God's will. And a lot of times when we pray this petition, I think that we think we're asking, Lord, may your secret will be done. May the things that you have decreed, may they be done. And usually when we're praying this, what we're not saying so much is, Lord, there was a risk that what you really wanted to happen wasn't going to happen, but we pray that it really would happen. What we're typically saying is, Lord, May we submit, may we be okay, may we not be upset with what your will is for our life. Now that is a good prayer to make. It's a difficult prayer to make, but it's a prayer that we do make. Father, your will be done, and let me not think less of you, let me not be angry with you because of your will. May I understand your will for my life. That is a good prayer to make. But it's important to understand that when we look at the Lord's prayer, we're looking at the revealed will. We're asking God. We're praying to God. May your revealed will, the Ten Commandments, God's Word, God's will for how we are to live, Lord, may that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we obey you. That's what this commandment is talking about. And it's not to take away from the other prayer. The other prayer is necessary. The prayer that we would submit, that we would rest in God's will for our lives. His secret will. But here we pray that God's will, His revealed will, His word, would be followed. So as we kind of break this down, as we look at what we're praying, we need to start with a recognition that God wants His will to be obeyed, that it matters. Matthew 7, which we read a few moments ago, in that chapter... Jesus is speaking about doing God's will. You know, he speaks in the the larger context. He's talking about the narrow gate, the wide gate, the tree, the fruit. And then he says in verse 21, which which we just read, he speaks about those who come up to him and say, Lord, Lord. He says, many will say, Lord, Lord. But not everyone who says that will enter the kingdom. Not, every, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What, what Jesus is saying here is that there are people who want to have Jesus as their Savior. They, they like the idea of grace, that we're forgiven, that Jesus has saved me, but they don't want to see him as Lord. 
And that's a pretty big deal. It's something we see a lot of. We, we want to hear the good stuff. Jesus is love. Jesus is forgiveness. Jesus is grace. But the idea that he is a Lord who says, you're my servant, follow my will, live according to my will, then we get a little bit, a little bit uppity. It's a little less comfortable. But Jesus is saying, no, just because you say I'm your Lord doesn't mean that you belong to me because by your fruit, by the way you act, you show if you actually belong to me the way you live, the way you follow my will, the way you long to follow my will matters. The tree is known by its fruits. Jesus saved us so that we could follow his will. Those who follow God's will, Jesus' Jesus' words there, like Jesus says in verse 24, like the man who built his house on a rock, the rock of God's word, it's solid. It's a foundation that you can build on. We read Romans 12 earlier where Paul speaks to the Romans about testing, you know, testing and proving, understanding what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. He's talking about the revealed will of God. We can know what it is and we can long to follow it. You know, sometimes we can hear the line, you know, we're all sinners. And that is a statement that is a good one to make. But sometimes we can kind of say it in a way that's not helpful. God's will matters. And if you ever say, we're all sinners, as a way to say, my own sin's not that big a deal. Or your sin's not that big a deal. That is a horrible misuse of that passage. If it's said from a contrite heart that recognizes that we're all sinners and says, I'm a sinner, I'm broken, I don't follow God's will, then that is a beautiful thing to say. But so often it's said as a way to minimize sin. We long, and we express it in this petition, we long to not be sinners. We long to follow God's will. The gospel is not about being content in our sin or somehow feeling okay about our sins. It's about hating them, fleeing from them, and coming to Christ and saying, I know I'm a sinner in need of saving, and I know my only hope is in Jesus Christ, and in Jesus I have been washed, I have been made new. This is not about saying, Lord, let me do your will so that I'll be right with you, so that I'll be loved by you. No, it's saying, I have been made right with you through Jesus Christ, and I love you, and I want to follow you. It's a prayer that's made knowing that we're right with God, knowing that sins matter, knowing that our sin matters. And knowing that God's will is beautiful. So God's will matters. And this petition recognizes that. And it prays, Father, let me let me live in obedience to you. Let my will be conformed to yours. And it's also a longing that God's will be done by all, by ourselves, but also by all men. This is something that is a challenge for us today. I think it's fairly common, even among Christians, to hear this. It's one thing for a non-believer to say to you, oh, well, that's good for you. If you believe that, that that's what's right and that's what God's will is, you know, good for you. Whatever whatever you need, it's okay. 
but it doesn't apply to me. Now, we often hear that, but what I'm starting to hear is a lot of Christians actually saying the same. Yes, that's okay for us. We believe this, but we don't want to impose our views on others. We don't want to say, well, what you're doing is wrong, because, well, if they don't think it's wrong, that might be their right. That, may, that might be what they think they should be doing. And so then God's will is largely irrelevant to them. It sounds nice. It sounds very affirming and, and accepting and what could be wrong with it. But the challenge is that when you say that, you're saying that God's will is not important, is not real that there is not a true God who is in heaven who has truly said this is what it looks like to live the way you were made to live. In a way, it's saying, yes, God, you're there, but you're only there for me. Your will is not important for me to think that it should apply to others. That's difficult for us to say today, but it's something that can be said in love. Where you can see somebody who does not recognize the will of God and you can say, I love you, but I can't love you less by telling you that God's will doesn't matter for you. You can't look at yourself, at your family, at your friends and say, I care so much about you, I don't want to impose God's will on you. That's not really loving. And when we say impose, it doesn't mean that we're going to force them, but it's going to be, mean that we cannot say to them, what you're doing is against God's will and it doesn't matter. We're going to say, no, we long to see God's will done. May your will be done, Father, on earth as it is in heaven. And this comes home also for us in the church. You know, we talk about interacting with the world. And, and being able to say in the world that, as Abraham Kuyper famously said, that there is not one square, square inch of this world over which Christ does not scream, Mine! It's related to the kingdom, but also when it comes to God's will being followed, we long to see it followed. But the challenge for us often comes even within the church. You know, perhaps you have that you know, our younger members with, with just hanging out with friends or kids at school, perhaps us as adults with our friends, that we know what God's will is, but we actually turn a blind eye to it, and we actually don't really care about how others treat people. We may hear somebody who is being racist or derogat making derogatory comments to women or who are bullies or who are cruel-hearted. This should not leave us unaffected. And when we pray this prayer, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying that we would follow God's will, but we also long to see it done in those around us. And so the question comes to us as we pray this, pray this petition. What's forming our hearts? Paul says Romans 12, 1 and 2, he speaks about what's forming their hearts. And he says, don't be conformed to the, the pattern of this world. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What we pray in this petition is that we would be formed by Christ. That we would have new hearts that we wouldn't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but we would be something that belongs to Jesus Christ and that we would long to see His will done in us and in the world. In this prayer, we confess that our hearts are hurt and burdened by a world that ignores God's will. You know, it's something that's difficult for us to see when we see people living a life that rejects God, but also which in 
embraces the fall into sin. And sometimes it's difficult to make this prayer, but we make it knowing that we long to see God's will done here on earth as it is in heaven, and we look forward to a time when the things of heaven will be the things of earth. You know, Peter says that, Second Peter 3. You know, he's looking forward. We, we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. You know, we're, we're looking forward to this, Peter says, so then make it your aim. Make, it, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with God. In other words, long to follow God's will in the midst of this world that is so different than God's will. Now, when we pray this petition, you know, the question also comes to us, how, is, how does God bring this about? What are we asking God to do? We read Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, famous words. And there's that wonderful line about writing God's will on our hearts. He's talking about this new covenant, the new way in which he's going to relate to his people. And he says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer will each one, shall each one teach the, his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. When we know the Lord by his spirit, he writes his law on our hearts. Romans 13 verse 10, you know, love is the fulfilling of the law. God inscribes his love on our hearts. And so what we pray in this petition is, Lord, write your love, inscribe it on my heart. Rewrite me. If you ever pray that way, Lord, rewrite me. Put me to death, bring Christ to life. That's what we pray. You know, obedience Obeying God's will is not, it's not about having our will and then somehow suppressing it and then doing what we actually didn't want to do. I think a lot of times we think of God's will that way. Well, this is what I want, but can't have it because God says I got to do this. So he's God, I guess I'm going to do this. When we read Jeremiah, when you read Romans 12, no, when we pray this petition, we're praying, Lord, rewrite my heart, remake my heart so that my will and your will are the same. Do you understand that? That that is a fundamentally different prayer than, Lord, make me just do what I don't want to do. I want to do what sin, Lord, make me do your will even though I don't want to. No, it's deny my will. Take my will, do away with it. May it be your will. It's a beautiful picture to think of a heart that is remade after the image of Christ. That's what you're praying. That you want to be able to love. That you want your heart to be tuned to his heart. And as we come to a close here, as we think about this petition, this prayer, what this petition is all about is a longing to fulfill the law, to love, as Paul speaks in Romans 13. As Paul says there, it's, a, it's to put away the deeds of darkness, to put on the armor of light. Paul says there, the night is ending, morning is here that you would be connected to the morning and not to the night. That you would put away that and put on Christ. That's what you pray when you pray this petition. You know, Father, inscribe your love on my heart. May it impact and rework my thoughts, my words, my actions. May I be a house that's built on the rock, on your word. And may you transform me 
by the renewing of my mind. That's what we pray. So let's continue to make this prayer and long to be remade. Let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, we praise your holy name and we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray, Father, that you would grant that we and all men may deny our own will and without any murmuring obey your will, for it alone is good. Grant also that everyone may carry out the duties of his office and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us now respond to the proclamation of the gospel by singing. And we will sing hymn 63, stanzas 1 and 2. This is the Lord's Prayer put to music. <laughs> 